Okay. Hello. Uh, welcome, everybody, to um, Tableau Symposium number 12, Connecting Biodiversity Data with Knowledge Graphs. Uh, my name is Rod Page, and together with Frank Michelle, the co-host, we've got um, a whole series of interesting talks for you on this topic. So um, just a few bits of housekeeping. So this is session 12 on Knowledge Graphs. Um, the session is recorded, as hopefully many of you are aware. Our aim is to have um, a series of talks limited to 10 minutes. So speakers, either Frank or myself, we will be gently prodding you um, at the 10 minute mark. We'll have three minutes for questions and a couple of minutes to swap over to the next speaker. Um, in terms of the questions, we've got the Hoover app. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, so there's a Q&A feature on that. We can post questions and either Frank or I will then go through those and read those out for the speaker to respond to. Uh, we're hoping that there'll be a, a bit of time at the end of the session for a more general kind of discussion. So fingers crossed everything works and bear with us as we play with the technology. So first up is myself um, introducing the symposium on knowledge graphs. So do, 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 do. share screen. Okay, we'll try that one more time. These are those technology things we talked about, and here we go. Okay, we can see your slide. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, so my goal in this um, first talk is to talk a little bit about knowledge graphs, to introduce the topic, and to make sure we're all sort of more or less on the same page about what we mean by knowledge graph. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the overall topic, and then finish up looking a little bit at Wikidata. So what is a knowledge graph? So a knowledge graph comprises three things. We have structured data, typically in a format called RDF. We have shared identifiers, which create links. And we're on, sitting on top of that, we have a query engine that allows us to ask certain kind of questions. Now to make that a little bit more clear, on the right, we've got a little diagram which shows say, a bunch of entities we might be interested in. And each one of these things we describe in a consistent structured way. The second thing we have in the diagram are these links. And these links are based on shared identifiers. So what that means is, for example, if I'm talking about a paper here, we always refer to that using its identifier, say DOI. And likewise, if you have a person, rather than refer to that person by their name, we use an identifier such as an ORCID ID. So we're using the shared identifiers, we can make links between these things that we're interested in. So we have things we care about, structured information about them, we have identifiers that make the links, and then finally we have this graph, this whole knowledge graph, and so we want some way of bouncing around that knowledge graph to ask questions that we're interested in. So those three things define the graph, structured information about things, links between the things, and a way to query them. Now, I thought it might be useful to try and sort of make an analogy between where we kind of are in a system that probably many of us understand very well, which is um, occurrence data, and compare that to knowledge graphs. So for example, occurrence data, observations of specimens and so on, at the individual level, we have a standard for describing them in terms of say, of Darwin core. If we want to move data around, we have a consistent format for doing that, the Darwin core archive. And we have a thinner way of describing the data. Now there's one tricky thing with this sort of data is often we want to convert descriptions of places into um, latitude and longitude. If we have a lot of occurrence data, we want to aggregate that. And we have sort of either regional aggregations like the Atlas of Living Australia, or we may have um, sort of more taxonomically focused aggregations such as VertNet. And then if we want to bring the whole thing together, of course, we have something like GBIF. So we have this idea of at local scale, we describe data, we then aggregate it at increasingly high levels. Now for knowledge graphs, you can sort of think of it in the same way. So at the level of things we're interested in, we have vocabularies for describing that data, for example, schema.org or other vocabularies, and Ailey is gonna be talking about one of those today. We have file formats for moving data around, such as nanopubs and JSON-LD. 
and Steve and Maria are going to be talking to us a bit about that. And the sort of equivalent to the geocoding problem is this idea of mapping strings to things. So when we, for example, talk about people, we don't want to just talk about their names, we want to map them to identifiers. And Matthias is going to be talking a bit about that. Once we have our data described in a consistent way using identifiers, then we can start to aggregate, we can start to make knowledge graphs. And these might be at the sort of local or regional kind of level or taxonomically focused. Things such as Open Biodiv, Ozymandias, and TaxRefLD. And Frank's going to be talking about some of those topics. And then finally, if we really got sort of global scale, we may have knowledge graphs, say, but like Wikidata. And then Andrew's going to touch a little bit on that. And I'll sort of spend the rest of this talk focusing on that as well. Okay, so we've got some context. Uh, now, for the rest of the time, I just want to look at a little bit at Wikidata. So Wikidata, one of the striking things about Wikidata is that it is big. Uh, this is from the, the founder of Wikidata, a recent tweet saying, look, we've got 400,000 contributors helping uh, grow Wikidata. It has 12 billion triples, that's 12 billion different statements that it makes. Millions of people are using this, and it has about 1.5 billion edits that people have made contributions to. So it's really, really big. It's quite an impressive thing. Now, I guess the one of the challenges is faced with numbers like that is what does it actually mean? And last year's TEDWIG, I sort of finished up a similar talk on knowledge graphs, sort of wondering, so we've got these numbers, what do they actually mean? How can we get a sense of how good these knowledge graphs are? So what I want to do is, is look at two aspects of Wikidata as a way to try to get a sense of how useful these kind of knowledge graphs might be. So the two questions I want to ask, especially is how dense is Wikidata? how richly interconnected is. This is the kind of the big selling point of a knowledge graph, the rich interconnections, how connected is it? And the second thing is how actively is it being edited? What's the kind of community like? Now, these are questions you could apply to Wikidata. I, you could also apply to other knowledge graphs. I'm just gonna focus on Wikidata. Now, I need to um, define what I mean by fact, and I have perhaps a slightly counterintuitive approach to this, but. Typically, we may have a database, say the one on the left, where we've got articles, and you may say there's an author, J. Smith, there's published in a journal called Zutaxa, and so on. From the point of view of a knowledge graph, these aren't really facts, they're just bits of text. Another way to think about this is, you could do this in an Excel spreadsheet. You don't need a knowledge graph for that kind of information. But in a knowledge graph, what we're aiming for is the article connected to an entity representing a person, not just a string, it's just a name, but an entity for that person, and likewise to a journal. So on the right-hand side, that information in the knowledge graph, we'd have two facts, the articles connected to two other things. So then we can say, okay, how many facts are, are in your knowledge graph? So I did this for Wikidata for a small subset of data. So this is a thousand taxonomic publications. And the mean density of facts for this data set was about four. So typically these things are connected to four other Wikidata items, say people or journals or so on. But the modal number of facts, the modal number of connections uh, was one. So most things are really only connected to one other thing. And in this case, these are articles, typically they're connected just to the journal. But interestingly enough, if you look at surveys of other knowledge graphs, most knowledge graphs are actually really sparse. Typically they're only connected to less than two other things. So Wikidata is doing really quite well. Now, one reason for this high density, relatively high density in Wikidata is the community. There are lots of people editing and contributing to this project. Now, I'm going to show you a visualization. Now, it's not a great visualization because I have to explain it. Um, but what you're going to see is for every item in Wikidata that I've looked at, these are thousand papers, I'm going to plot when was that created on the vertical axis and also going to plot any edits on the horizontal axis. So somebody adds, say, an article to Wikidata and they just put it there and nobody else looks at it. This will appear along this diagonal line here. But if somebody comes along and edits it, so maybe adds a DOI or a link to the author, they'll pop out to the right. So the next slide, what you want to see is, is there anything here in this lower triangle that indicates that people are coming along and curating the data? If everything sits along the diagonal, Wikidata is essentially like a data dump, people are putting things out. Now, it turns out that for these 1,000 articles, so they sit along the diagonal, that's when they're created, but there's a huge amount of edit activity. All these dots here represent people coming along and adding or embellishing or curating to that content. So there's a lot of curation happening in Wikidata. 
This is being done um, by a whole set of sources. This is a sort of plot to the numbers of edits. Um, Color-coded blue is a bot and orange is a person. So there's a long, long tail of editors. So some of these are very active people coming along and adding information. Others are bots sort of scanning and adding bits and pieces. And there's a long tail of people who are only peripherally interested in taxonomy, but are coming along and contributing. So to sort of um, summarize, I guess the take home messages here is, is I think one of the most important things to have in a knowledge graph is density of connections. If we want to make the rich kind of apps we're aiming for, like this sort of thing that I put together earlier this year, this is a little tool to kind of link taxonomic names to publications to people. It's still not easy to do that because you still have to go and retrieve these connections. They're not all yet in a knowledge graph. So if we want apps like this, we need densely connected knowledge graphs. The sort of dirty secret is that most knowledge graphs are not densely connected. They typically tend to have fairly low density. Wikidata seems to be an exception to this. And I think the reason for that exception and the sort of superpower of Wikidata is that community of people coming along and editing it and curating it and constantly improving that data. So this is one reason why I think Wikidata is, is certainly well worth engaging with. It's that richness of the, the, the content being constantly curated that I think is gonna increase its density and increase its utility. So thank you very much um, for your attention with that. So let me just, um, I will unshare this. And hopefully that has set the scene for some of the topics that we're going to um, be visiting with the, the coming speakers. So thanks, Rod, and you're even be beneath the 10 minutes limit, so that's perfect. And we already have a bunch of questions. Um, okay, I'll read the first one for of Jorit. How do you imagine integrating knowledge graph Wikidata in the scholarly record? In other words, how would you cite pieces of the knowledge graph so that you can retrieve the reference knowledge in 10, 20 years from now? Tough one. It is an interesting question. I, I guess we've had a, a sort of offline discussion about this. So I, I think, so one approach to this is, I guess the question is because Wikidata is constantly changing and evolving, um, how do you cite it if you come back next week and things have changed? And I think practically most people doing an analysis on a knowledge graph like Wikidata would grab a snapshot at the time of the things they're interested in. So for example, I could grab a snapshot of every taxonomic paper and freeze that, make that available to somebody else. And my analysis would be on that subset. But I think realistically, any large scale database is gonna be constantly changing. And the notion that we can snapshot these things is, is problematic. I mean, we don't have version timestamps of GBIF. Um, it, it's gonna be a challenge to have timestamp versions of Sovaki data. Right, I'm going to the next one. Oh, okay. And, and Questions are starting to pile. I'm not sure we're gonna have time for all of them. Next one is uh, from Nikki. You compared the connectivity between the selected taxonomy articles in Wikidata and, oops, and other knowledge graphs. What subject coverage uh, did the other knowledge graphs have? Perhaps bibliographic data in particular, amen amenable to linking. So if I understand correctly, I guess the, the question is where did that benchmark come from? Um, those other knowledge graphs are, I forget exactly the topics they covered. There's a, there's a paper cited on, on the slide that actually looked at knowledge graphs and other kind of areas. So that's sort of my benchmark is typically most of these are less than two. Um, Wikidata of course covers everything and, and the coverage, the connectivity seems to be a bit higher. I hope I've understood that, that question. Uh, maybe Nikki can say a word if he's around. Oh, this is good. Um, okay, so I have a bit of difficulty to follow up with the different questions. Um, okay, next one would be, I think, yeah, we still have time for one. Uh, what are some example use cases of queries that have been guiding your thought on knowledge graphs in biodiversity? So, so maybe to just give one example, and this, this would sort of link with the kind of things that David Shorthouse has been doing. So if you follow his binomial project, he often will tweet that a certain person studied a particular group of organisms based on specimen records. I'd love to be able to do the same thing based on a link between that person, their publications, 
and the taxon taxonomic species they describe. So we can actually derive the same kind of statement that this person worked in this taxonomic group, either through the literature or through specimens from GBIF. Ideally, they'd be the same, and that might be a way to help sort of mutually verify that we have actually identified this person and actually what they actually actively work on. Uh, we are already at the end of every three minutes uh, slot for Q and A. Thank you to all the questions. I'm sorry we we couldn't address all of them, but these questions will remain online and we can still continue to interact um, on the platform. Okay, so uh, next is going to be my turn. Can you see my slide? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, I'll start with this second talk. Thanks, thanks for that. This this is this is a nice introduction to the uh, to the session actually, and uh, in this one I would like to start uh, with a brief look back at what we've been doing in, bio, in terms of biodiversity knowledge graphs so far. Um, um, well, ju just a word first, I don't intend to be exhaustive here. So I will certainly uh, forget many things and many works that have been done so far. Uh, but uh, my point is, is just to, to have a quick look back at where we come from. Um, the first, the first paper I've seen talking about uh, applying semantic web and linked data technologies uh, in the context of uh, biodiversity is one of yours, Rod. It dates back to 2006. Maybe there were other works before, I'm not sure. And that's also the year when uh, the first version of the Tidrig ontologies were published. Uh, and just as an information, the RDF version of the Darwin core vocabularies uh, was, was published much later. But in any case, these are vocabularies. Uh, and when it comes to actual knowledge graphs that are possibly published using those vocabularies, the ones have found, the oldest ones I have found, date back to 2009. Uh, it started with taxon concept and geospecies, which I'm not sure are maintained. I think they are not today. Um, interestingly enough, in 2010, uh, uh, I have uh, checked on DBpedia, and that, that's the date of the first mapping for the taxo box. So you know that Wikipedia, Wikipedia has info boxes for the taxonomic pages. It, it's called the taxo box. And when you have a mapping for, of that taxo box, then that data is published to DBpedia. So I think, if I believe this, this history record, 2010 is the first time we had taxonomic information directly published in DBpedia. Um, no, sorry. Um, as you notice, uh, sorry, the next ones uh, that was in 2013, next ones that I have seen again, there are probably many other works, uh, was NCBA, the taxonomy of NCBA published in RDF, then vertebrate taxon ontology. And uh, uh, the last one, Tax D, is a work I've done with the Museum of Natural History of Paris that consists in publishing the, the French taxonomic register uh, in RDF, so it dates back to 2017. And as you can notice, these graphs are mostly about taxonomy, that is registries of taxa and scientific names. Uh, that actually makes sense because taxonomic registers are the backbone of multiple databases and applications. And uh, I guess it felt totally natural to start by publishing those registries uh, in the web of data before being able to publish other data. Now, if we look beyond strictly taxonomic registers, there are some other works. Um, Encyclopedia of Life uh, once published the trade bank as an RDF graph. I think this is no longer maintained because they moved to uh, the new 4G technology. And, and I don't think the RDF version of the knowledge graph is, is still uh, published yet. You can consider this is a knowledge graph, whether it is, it is in RDF or in another graph database. Uh, then the usual suspects, Ozymandias, uh, which, <clears throat> sorry, that uh, 
in, in which uh, Rod uh, compiled a set of information about the Australian fauna, its about taxonomy, publications, and authors. Um, <clears throat> Pensoft has produced the Open Biodiv uh, Knowledge Graph, which is also about taxonomy, publications, and authors. Um, in TaxRefLD, we have uh, proposed some uh, extensions of strictly the taxonomy to uh, uh, encompass publications, statuses, that is, um, Bio, biogeographical statuses, red list statuses, or legal statuses. Legal, I mean things like um, international regulations, conventions, protections about some species. And we have also tried to model species interactions. Uh, Globi also provides an RDF dump of their uh, interactions. And, uh, and Rod mentioned uh, already Wikidata and the fact that there are lots and lots of, of uh, data pouring, regularly pouring into Wikidata. And here I have more difficulty to, to describe precisely what's the extent of data that is actually published in terms of biodiversity data uh, in, in Wikidata. Now, there are certainly other works that should be mentioned here, but the fact is that there are still little works uh, that have focused on publishing all sorts of biodiversity data as knowledge graphs apart from taxonomies. Um, and in particular, major actors like GBIF have not dived into this yet, as far as I know. Um, so what's next? What are the types of data that remain to publish as knowledge graphs? Uh, <clears throat> well, we can think of many, many different things. Uh, you can think of collections and specimen. And there are already existing big platforms like Disco and iDigBio that could be translated into knowledge graphs. Uh, there are literature platforms like Biodiversity Heritage Library and Plazi, occurrences in GBIF I mentioned, life traits. Uh, you can think about phenotype information about interactions as this is done already in Globi, but you can go beyond this. You could try to link things with uh, DNA sequences and ecology information and geography references and so on. So there might already be some existing knowledge graphs here and what remains to do is to connect our own knowledge graphs with those knowledge graphs so that we can have highly interconnection in uh, and a high interconnection between those graphs because that's where the value comes from. Now, to publish all of these knowledge graphs, there are quite a few challenges to tackle. Uh, first one is about the fact that you could see several, uh, you could see the same reality through several perspectives. This is a slide I presented in Dundin back in 2018 uh, about how to model taxonomy. And here, these are three different ways. One that I called the thesaurus perspective, the biological perspective, the taxonomic rank. And, and at the bottom, you have the, the knowledge graphs that use the, those modeling perspectives. In the middle, I've, I've been interested more specifically in this one, uh, in the middle, what I call the biological perspective, because here you can understand a class, a taxon as being a class, and a class is meant of individuals. And in that case, individuals are the actual living organisms, that is the biological organisms that are the members of, of the taxa. That's why we call that the biological perspective. Um, here is another, an, another example. Uh, this is an interaction that you can find in, Blo in Globi, for instance, between the monarch that pollinates the white iceberg, Aster, sorry. Um, <clears throat> this is this is correct, although this well this is not 100% true because that interaction is true when it comes to adult uh, individuals. When you're talking about larva individuals, well they do not pollinate white ester. Probably they would acquire nutrients from it, but they would not pollinate it. The second interaction, I'm not sure about it to be honest. I, I made it up just for the example. So you could explain, you could describe this in, in RDF or, or whatever in, in your knowledge base, but this lacks a bit of, of uh, specificity. And you, you may want to model this uh, in, a, in a more specific manner. Uh, and one way of doing that is to say, okay, here I have the, this bubble here, which is the class of all the individuals, the monarch individuals, whatever the development stage. And here, I will create some sort of fake class, which is the, the class of all organisms in the adult stage. All organisms, whatever their development stage, whatever their species, no, sorry, whatever their species. So it's all adult individuals, whatever the species. And what you can say is that 
the interaction between monarch and white aster actually occurs with this intersection here. That's only the monarch individuals that are in the adult stage that pollinate the white aster. And you can find the same thing with the larva stage. So this is this is this can seem a bit uh, artificial, but that actually works in the in the sense that you have precise uh, means to describe very precisely the semantics of your data. And for those who are interested in uh, take details, uh, the web ontology language allows you to describe this kind of thing very precisely. You can describe those classes here. Uh, of all the individuals in the other stage, all of a stage, and describe the intersections and so on. Um, okay, so just a few uh, conclusions and takeaways. What I've said here is that uh, there is still a lot of biodiversity data that awaits publication as knowledge graphs. They are available in major portals like GBIF and uh, Catalog of Life and Encyclopedia of Life. And most of the time, they are available through web APIs, but these are not connected. These are silos. So can publishing them as knowledge graphs could make it possible to connect them much more effectively. Um, yet, we have to think twice be before we do this kind of publication. Um, there are several issues that we should be concerned with. Uh, the fact that uh, if you want to foster trust in your knowledge graph, the knowledge graphs that you're publishing and interconnecting with, you need to ensure data quality, data completeness. You need to provide information as to the provenance of your source data and so on. Disambiguation is a very strong problem and uh, interconnection is even more complicated. That is, you, you need to interconnect graphs so that it brings values. Uh, can we use Wikidata as a hub? That was a suggestion of, uh, of Rod some time, uh, some time ago. And that's, that's, that remains an open question. Uh, I'm a bit off top, out of time. So uh, I also mentioned that there are some quite, quite some different challenges about how you, can, you design uh, the data, how, what is the perspective that you adopt to represent your data. And the Symphonic Web is really about representing this semantics, but you can do it in several manners. So there is probably a trade-off to be found between how correct and accurate the semantics of your data is and how usable it is in terms of concrete applications development. And this is it for me. Sorry for the delay. That was great. Thanks very much, Frank. And you, we've still got a lot of time um, for questions. So <clears throat> don't worry about that. One that seems to pop up is one from Dimitri who's asking, um, I guess a fairly general problem about scaling. So easy scaling is one of the biggest problems with knowledge graphs. Um, so do you anticipate any kind of issues with, with scaling knowledge graphs up, um, in particular when you query it? Um, are there gonna be limits to querying these kind of knowledge graphs? It, depend, it depends what we're, we're doing. If, if this is just about querying data, well, to my mind, there is not, more problem in terms of size than when any, any other type of database. I mean, Wikidata is huge and you can query it rather efficiently, rather. Um, if you want to query to make some very well, clever query that search through different passes through your knowledge graph, that becomes more difficult to solve. And if you add reasoning on top of that, that becomes even more time consuming. So. Yes, that there can be uh, uh, problems in terms of size of your knowledge graphs and what are the queries that you can pose on them uh, and what is the complexity of the queries. Um, so I, I don't have any answer more than that. So yes, we have to take care about, about that and having big machines in, is not enough. So you have to take care to think about which, which are the scenarios that you want to address and which are the queries that you're gonna derive from these scenarios and maybe modeling the data in a way that makes it more easily queryable for this specific scenario. That's great. Um, so that seems to be all the current questions and um, keep posting questions people. We will also try and come back during this symposium and answer them. So um, <clears throat> I think you're right on time, which is going well. Um, I'm assuming I'm reading this question incorrectly. So next up is um, Matthias, who's going to be talking a bit about the strings and things issues. Um, 
Excellent. Tius, it's all yours. Thanks, Rod. I'll just see if I can share. Can you see the slides? Yes, yes, we can. That's great. OK, thanks. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, ambiguity in collection data. And while well, the title is what are deliberately ambiguous, what I really want uh, to talk about is, is people in collection data. And you may wonder why people, because it doesn't seem like um, in collections people are at the center of things. It's more the specimens themselves and the scientific data related to those specimens. But people are rather central to society and throughout their lives, more today, but even in history, they leave around a lot of pieces of evidence, lots of traces of information and connections to other people. And through that, they can provide us a lot of information that um, may help us build stronger uh, knowledge graphs. And more specifically, it helps us facilitate um, cross-validation of the data that we already have, provide some more uh, certainty about the, the, the veracity of it, fill up gaps of things we don't know, but which we can infer by building these, these uh, hubs around people. Uh, we can avoid a lot of redundancy of doing the same work all over and over again, including things like georeferencing and taxonomic determinations. We can connect to other graphs and find lots and lots of other more content related to the specimens that we have. And even from a historical point of view, we can shape uh, some historical context this way and provide set some light on uh, more controversial issues like in the past slavery and sexism, which often had quite an impact on uh, specimen gathering. So the people in collections, they have played and still play quite a lot of different roles, but historically and still today, oftentimes we um, identify them to their names. But as you can see there on the right, names are not necessarily good, um, unique identifiers, and they may be templated in various ways, which complicates quite a lot um, machine readability and hence making them a part of these knowledge graphs. And to solve that, we can um, use PIDs rather than names. And fortunately, we have quite some good uh, registries already available in which we can um, uh, identify these people. So we have ORCID uh, for researchers. We have Wikidata, which Rod already mentions as an open database for basically anything, but at least notable humans can be listed in there quite extensively. Um, and also, it has the appeal that you can easily add and edit data in there. And there's also other databases like uh, VF or ISNI for content creators and more even more specific ones like um, for the plant names index biodiversity heritage library, which are more specific to the sector of our natural history collections. But that also uh, helps us uh, make this ambiguate because we exclude a lot of the people who are definitely not uh, related to the specimens that we're talking about. But we have this, we have this, these name strings and we have the, the things that we want to make of them, but how do we actually go about doing this? And um, in the, the working group that we've been working with, which the authors, which I've said at the beginning of these presentations, we've been uh, trying to come up with a simple sort of template of how this is being done. And we've come up with um, a way of seeing this. It always starts with a, a trigger, a reason and a context in which it takes place that we want to do this disambiguation process, go from a lot of different name strings to actual things representing unique identities of these people. And this can happen during digitization of the specimen data related to that specimen, um, part of a digitization pipeline, part of a dedicated text transcription process, doing database import where some restrictions may apply, connections need to be made. It can also be done by enriching or validating content that is already available, but which may not be in optimal quality. And when we look at this trigger, there's a couple of questions that we need to ask ourselves before we can come up with the way we're actually going to implement it. And uh, if you can look at that graph on the slide, you can see that there is quite a long tail in terms of how many agent strings we have, but don't really contribute much to the vast amount of specimens that we possess. Typically, there's uh, quite a few collectors who have collected quite a lot. And if we manage to connect those to identifiers, we can already um, do a lot of, do, um, cover a lot of the collections that we want to cover. So the first question is how many strings are we talking about? How many do we want to link? How many specimens do we want to process? And the second one is, what is the quality of these names that we have? Are they already properly templated in such a sort of structure that we can use? For instance, for the data import guidelines or even restrictions, which limit the number of a variety, a variety that we can see in our databases. And also how commonly are homonyms and synonyms? So how commonly do we have name strings, unique name strings that can refer to different people, or if we have the same person identified in many, many different ways. 
And the second thing that we typically will need for disambiguation is other data often tied to those specimens. We need dates, locations, relations like um, people who collected along with some word of some person, maybe even writing clues like signatures. And if you want to leverage these, they need to be ideally machine readable. This is going to be oftentimes a stretch still today. So some cleaning may be needed, but sometimes they're not even human readable or they're not even reliable to use. And so if they're not reliable, if we know from experience that these data are quite sketchy, we definitely don't want to use them for disambiguation because we're just going to make matters worse. Once we've covered these questions, um, we may want to look at actually how to implement um, this disambiguation process. And roughly speaking, you can think of um, the classic artisanal way of covering each name string or even each specimen, because it's possible that a name string in different contexts and different specimens refers to different people. One by one, looking through registries, databases, books, encyclopedia, and trying to come up with a rather certain identity of who this person is and, and applying the link. But this is, of course, a very labor intensive process. If we think of millions of specimens, it's not realistic. And there are automated approaches uh, that we can already implement today. We can uh, link a lot of low hanging fruit by clustering them uh, along rather, rather certain identities or auto linking uh, the labels that we have to pits to rather unique names, especially in certain contexts. And we can process large, large volumes of data this way. But what we typically will need, especially when we have rather uh, ambiguous common names, uh, machine readable metadata to actually filter for the right persons. And this will always, while well, we can do lots of lots of data this way, we need to be able to implement it. We need the expertise and we need the post processing validation step because the error rate is going to be quite a bit higher than when doing things manually. So here's an example of a spreadsheet um, that we used at, at the garden here, uh, at Mesa Botanic Garden, where we linked um, a couple of hundred of our most common collectors to a few persistent identifiers, going through them manually, looking through all the resources, which was a very time consuming and labor intensive exercise. And when people look at spreadsheets, they may also uh, find them after a while very mind numbing, but still in the course of a couple of dozens hours, this was a doable exercise. So it's not like we can cover a substantial amount of of our collections through this uh, very simple manual process. But there's also some um, automated clustering approaches that we can think of. And here's an example of a flowchart, a rules-based flowchart, which we can apply manual auto-linking from name to string using uh, dates as a refining measure. And when you look at the results of, for instance, this approach in this table, you can see that um, quite some very trivial matches are immediately made, but some others are probably incorrect or even definitely incorrect. And some uh, others need to be refined because we found multiple results in Wikidata, which may be through duplicates, but it also may not be the case. And then the final step of this process is we need to make these data available, these links, because otherwise we can't do much, much with them and others also can't do much with them. And fortunately enough, in the past few years, there have been quite some developments um, in the standards organizations in um, supporting this more and more uh, in Darwin Core and other standards. So taking Darwin Core as an example, um, this year, the new terms recorded by ID and identified by ID were ratified and also now supported by GBIF to easily supply bits instead of name strings um, to these platforms. But there's also some limitations to this because some other metadata related to people will not be able to uh, supply this way, or at least not in a um, systematic way that's easy to interpret. And for that, an extension to Darwin Core is still in, under development called the Agents Attribution Extension, which also uh, which supports um, offering multiple persistent identifiers for the same person and has more detailed data about collecting teams. But uh, this one can currently be tested on the GBF sandbox, but it is still not in the final state and not ratified yet. And also the Darwin Core RDF guide um, allows us to, in a very structured way, supply multiple identifiers and uh, bits instead of name strings for people using the Darwin Core IRI namespace. Uh, this is, for instance, implemented uh, in the CTAF specimen preview profile which is used uh, along with CTAF specimen identifiers for physical specimens, and is also made use of in uh, the, the botany pilot, which uh, is one is a thing, something that I will uh, end with in this presentation. 
Um, here you can see the agent extension um, in action. Uh, there's an example link in the presentation, which you can see if you look at the presentation later, but there's some still unresolved problems which you can help us resolve if you look at uh, the GitHub repository for this extension. And um, as a final example uh, to close with, I wanted to mention the botany pilot because in this uh, exercise, we use a combination of the manual approach and an automatic approach to link uh, person names in collections to uh, persistent identifiers. And for this process, which was uh, led by the, the CTLF ISTC group, um, for each participating institution, a few hundred person names, the most common ones, were linked to uh, persistent identifiers, which took quite some uh, labor hours. But for each institution, up to 50% of the specimens for which some collector information was known could be linked to PITS this way, to this manual exercise. And when we did the same thing using an automatic simple process, we could go up to 60%, recover much more specimens this way, but with a larger error rate. And although the, the labor uh, for this effort was much slower, still the effort, uh, the, um, the automatic approach needs to be developed and needs to be implemented, which also takes quite some time. Uh, and in this process, up to 1.5 million specimens could be linked uh, to persistent identifiers. And as you can see in the botany pilot uh, demonstrator, which is linked below, that's not just to each other, but also to lots of lots of other uh, pieces of uh, biodiversity knowledge, uh, brief to the knowledge graph. Um, here is an, uh, an example of this, and I hope I'm not over time. Marius, yes, you're, you're beyond 11 minutes now. Okay, well, this is my last slide, so I think that should be fine. And you can see the advantage of using uh, persistent identifiers for people rather than just the name strings. So these affiliations at the bottom don't matter as much anymore, but so long as you have the York IDs. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, yeah, very interesting problem. And I know many people in the audience have already tried to tackle with this kind of disambiguation issues. Um, trying to keep up with the questions. Uh, there's one question. What is the one thing that natural history collections can do to contribute to disambiguating people? Well, I think the one thing is going through this exercise, the one that I described, and to actually even just manually, even linking the first 10 or 100 of the most common collectors and attaching pits to them and making these data available. Because the more this happens, the easier it becomes for other collections to do the exercise because they are more certain that these people, which we can identify with bits, are connected to specimens, so they are specimen collectors, and we get more certainty throughout all this process. Um, whereas currently, oftentimes, we're not really sure when we have a bit whether this person actually collected anything or whether he's or he or she is a naturalist uh, involved in the subject, but not necessarily someone who is active in the field. Okay, thank you. Um... I think there is no more question. Maybe I have a quick one. In the botany pilot uh, that you presented at the end, uh, you said that the automatic method uh, came uh, produced four to six percent uh, of errors. How did you measure that number of errors? What is a manual uh, check of botanists that, that did the job for you? Yeah. Yeah. So that was a manual check on a, on a subset to provide an estimate. Okay. Because doing everything was um, for thousands and thousands of names was not a realistic. Yeah, so it's an so estimate of measuring. Yeah, it was a subsampling. Okay. Okay, any other questions in the audience? Um, last one. What about identifiers such as ResearchGate profile ID? And uh, the, there is another one related, I think, from Rod. Can you comment on whether identifiers such as ID are being taken up, research, uh, taken up by researchers in the field? So increasingly, org IDs are being taken up because they're increasingly being used as a requirement for scientific publishing. And I think also increasingly, the appeal of these identifiers is, is um, well, it's, it's also increasing because through org ID, it becomes possible to provide statistics for not only specimens, but publishing as well. And 
these statistics are very interesting to put on CVs and to put in reporting. And that's what administrators and policymakers care about. And how about the research gate profile ID? Yeah, that's one thing I wanted to touch, but yeah, it was a bit uh, difficult in, in to come up with time. Um, there's a huge amount of different person IDs available. The ones I listed are only a very, very small subset. And in theory, um, any identifier can be used depending on how persistent the, uh, the repository is. Because as long as somebody has made the connection and if someone else has made the connection as well, then we have this link. Because we, otherwise we need to go to a data broker to find it. But in practice, of course, um, some identifiers are less used. Maybe they get the web created or may even cease to be uh, persistent and may have uniqueness issues. Um, in, in my personal opinion, I think it's still a question of the more identifiers, the better. So look at quite a few different resources and try to link to them um, as much as possible. But of course, there's no point in linking to the, the hundreds and hundreds of different registries that are currently available, especially because they're not always as stable. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Matthias. Um, and uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, that's gonna be Steve, right? Yes. Uh, talk is having your cake and eating it too, JSON LD as an RDF serialization format. Yeah, and if you don't mind putting the link in the chat yeah. to the. Um... I will do that right away. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, in this talk, I'm going to be using the Lord of the Rings as an allegory with data providers and their tables developers in their JSON and linked data advocates with their RDF as the elf lords. It's my goal in this talk to convince you that JSON LD is the one ring that can satisfy and rule over the three lords of Tadwig. I'll start by introducing the three key features on which my argument is based. The first is JSON. JSON is an acronym for JavaScript object notation. It's a simple structured data exchange format, and it's the most common format used to transmit data from APIs or application programming interfaces. It's also easily consumed by most programming languages and web pages. The second feature is JSON-LD. JSON-LD is a JSON-based serialization for linked data. All JSON-LD is valid JSON, so it's 100% compatible with existing JSON parsers and libraries. And it's Google's preferred format for structured metadata and web pages and is therefore widely used. A subset of JSON LD can be used as a serialization format for resource description framework or RDF. And importantly, for a standards organization like Tadwig, JSON LD is a W3C standard. When I talk about a narrow design pattern, I mean imposing limitations on how JSON-LD should be structured so that it allows us to meet multiple goals. This is where the cake part comes in. I got this idea from several sections of the design patterns document of the highly successful IIIF International Image Interoperability Framework. Section 2.7 of that document says that we should make it possible to use RDF technology with JSON-LD while not requiring it. Section 2.8 of, of the document says that developers should be able to use the JSON-LD without needing to know anything about RDF. The various parts of section three of the document describe limitations in the form of JSON-LD that makes its structure predictable and makes its patterns easy to remember and use. In the context of Tadwig, the limitations we set should make the patterns familiar to people like providers who are used to dealing with tabular data. In the rest of this talk, I'll make the case that a narrow JSON-LD design pattern can make it possible to convert conventional tabular data into a transfer format that will allow it to simultaneously be loaded into a triple store as linked data yet also to be consumed as normal JSON by applications. If properly constructed, this JSON-LD can be both self-describing and lossless. 
In the next section of the talk, I'll describe in broad terms three overarching principles for a design pattern appropriate for Tadley. The first principle I call simple Darwin core principle because it maps data to a flat un, in a flat unnested way, similar to the way that a row applies to a single resource in simple Darwin core. The correspondence between a JSON object and a row in simple Darwin core should be apparent. The names in the name value pairs should be term names, just as they are in table column headers. The values in name value pairs should be simple data values, just as they are in a table row. I call the second principle the star schema principle. There should be no more than one level of nesting below the core JSON object. This is similar to the limitation of single links from core to extension tables in a Darwin core archive. This nesting allows for situations where there are one-to-many relationships with other objects that don't have assigned identifiers, that is, blank nodes. However, unlike Darwin Core Archives, this structure is not limited to a single link from a core resource because additional links can be made to an external reference uh, to a resource somewhere else. This is a critical difference that overcomes a serious deficiency of the existing star schema system. To make the JSON LD both simple, but also self-describing, whenever possible, the values in name value pairs should be simple strings and numeric values as they would appear in a table, and it should not contain nested objects. Additional semantics should be described in the context section rather than by nesting it within the data. This allows a consuming application to discover those constraints in a single place and apply them anywhere in the data set. The context section should be included within the document itself rather than in a link document to avoid the need to dereference an external URL. You can read the full details of this design pattern in the link document that has been posted in the chat. I'll finish this talk by talk mentioning two existing implementations of this design pattern and suggesting a third situation where I think it might be useful. A region of interest is a specific part of a media item designated by a newly adopted set of terms in Audubon Core. Examples are spatially bounded regions in an image and temporally bounded segments of a sound recording. A single item can have several ROIs that apply to multiple representations. This single level of one-to-many relationships is suitable for the suggested design pattern. The Audubon Core Maintenance Group has created a recipes document showing how tabular ROI data can be transformed to JSON-LD for several kinds of examples. Normative metadata for the six existing TadWord standardized control vocabularies are available in tabular format, and we're currently working on obtaining non-normative metadata for these vocabularies translated into other languages. So please help us to do this by going to our translation workshop on Thursday. These two tabular sources can be combined into a single JSON LD file by a script. I've created a web application showing how JSON LD can be consumed on the fly to generate a term list for Darwin Core Establishment means controlled vocabulary in any of three available languages. I've also loaded the Audubon Core format controlled vocabulary into a triple store where you can explore relationships between concepts using Sparkle queries. The last example applies to the, the design pattern to a difficult problem, expressing Darwin Core resource relationship records as linked data. We were unable to figure out how to do this when we wrote the RDF guide, but with recent term clarifications and additions, it's now possible. As defined in Darwin Core, the resource relationship terms are used to describe relationships that are analogous to statements that we make in RDF triples, but by representing them in tabular form. Using the RDF reification vocabulary model and some bits from the wiki-based data model, we can map components of the resource relationship in instances to a linked data graph model. The sticky part is that we'd rather identify the nodes and edges using IRIs, but IRIs aren't required as identifier values in resource relationship terms. We can get around this using a trick suggested by the new definitions of the terms. Leave the subject predicate and object nodes as blank nodes, but link them to resource relationship identifiers using the property DC terms identifier. 
This allows us to create JSON LD that looks relatively flat and almost conforms to the narrow design pattern while still making sense according to the graph model I just presented. If we load the JSON LD into a triple store, we can then do a clever trick. Using a relatively simple Sparkle construct query, we can use the provided non IRI identifiers to generate valid SCOLUM IRIs to replace the blank subject and object nodes and provide the required property IRI for the predicate. The end result is a simple valid RDF triple that represents the resource relationship. If such a triple were generated for each resource relationship, the much simpler resulting graph could be easily queried. I'll conclude by returning to our Lord of the Rings and uh, uh, allegory. In the book, against all odds, the one ring is destroyed by dropping it into a volcano, freeing all the beings of Middle Earth from its mastery. The elves sail away to do their things in another land. The dwarves go back to their mines, and the humans are left free to make war and slaughter each other. In our allegory, we ignore Jason LD, leaving the linked data people free to putter around with RDF that no one uses the providers free to search through their own siloed data and developers to create and use whatever unstandardized APIs they want. Wait, wait a minute. Is that actually a happy ending for a standards organization like Tad Tadwig? In our allegory, Sauron should be the good guy. If we're serious about interoperability and linking data, it seems to me like there are few options that could satisfy our constituencies as well as JSON LD. I would urge our Sauron the technical architecture group to consider whether JSON LD is suitable to be a common data transfer format used across TABRIC standards. Thank you very much, Steve, for this trip into Tarkin's world. Unexpected, I must admit. <laughs> I don't know if those who are part of the TADWIC tag will recognize them, themselves as uh, being part of Sauron. <laughs> um, well, I'm on the well, tag, so I I will yeah. I'll accept that label. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I will start with a question of Rod. Uh, JSON LD is becoming more popular. Um, oops, will this create a mess of incompatible ways to describe the same data? So wait a second. While JSON LD, um, Rod, maybe you can comment on the link you pasted in the in the question. Sorry. Um, so, Steve, I've been cataloging different occurrences of JSON LD that I see in the wild on publishers, book publishers, uh, people, all sorts of places. And there's lots of scope for doing it in different ways. So, I guess my concern is, won't we just have a whole exciting but messy situation, different kind of ways to do this? Yeah. Well, that's why the. I guess I would say the point here is the narrow design pattern. If you look at the, what Triple IF does they prescribe very strictly how the JSON LD should be constructed. So everyone who uses those um, restricted design patterns can, basically creates compatible JSON that developers can just treat as like JSON they get, that they would get from an API. So my idea would be that we would develop a similarly restricted design pattern that would make it possible for uh, people to, to uh, present the data and still have it be consumable without somebody having to understand or figure out which particular structure was chosen. And there is another question from Jorit. Um, JSON LD is fun when applied to small data. What is your experience in dealing with billions of JSON documents? Uh, none. <laughs> so I think part of, you know, one of the things I've struggled with is you know, is there going to be some big player who's going to create a massive triple store somewhere for everybody to use? And I think the conclusion, unless you think that's Wikidata, is probably no. So the point of this would be if, if people expose a narrowly defined JSON LD, then people could basically harvest the parts of it that they want and load it into a local triple store and do whatever they want with it. So, you know, the ability to be able to do this would depend on uh, you know, how, how much data you would be able to, uh, to load. Yeah, maybe as a compliment, uh, in the bioschemas.org uh, project, we, we have this idea of uh, 
well, the, the, the goal is to use schema.org to annotate bio, biology resources on the web. Uh, and uh, as Rod said, uh, as, as you said, sorry, uh, Google, the, the preferred format of uh, schema.org, more or less, that is Google, is now JSON LD. That means that at some, we are in the process of getting to billions of pages annotated with a piece of JSON LD that can be scraped and loaded into a triple store. And that, that's part of the tools that are being developed. So I'm not saying that uh, these tools can now support billions of documents. Uh, I think that still, this is, this is the goal. This is where we are heading to. So, but you, you, I understand your question, definitely, Jory, that and, probably and a concerning issue. That, you know, the transformation of of uh, tabular resource relationship data into a triple is basically something that only needs to be done once, assuming that the underlying data is not changing. So over time, if those data got dumped into a large triple store, it wouldn't require everyone to do it over and over again. And if there is no more question, maybe I will take the next one. Um, Steve, you mentioned this, this recommendation of uh, that is, meant to limit the, the depth of your json -LD documents. I'm not sure I understood. The point is where to avoid having too many blank notes so that you can flatten things. Uh, and instead of having uh, deep structures, you put them outside with a specific ID so that you avoid blank notes. That's the idea? Yes. And so the, the idea would be that it would make it easier for someone to map tabular data into a structure like this. The problem is that you can't make those external links if, if things don't have uh, IRI identifiers. And our, our community has been very slow and reluctant to, uh, to adopt any uniform system of IRI identifiers. So that's one reason for making the links internally uh, through, but you know, right now we're limited in the uh, star schema to a single link, and those links don't have to have identifiers. But if you want to make if you want to make links broader than that, then you're going to have to basically have an an external IRI identifier to make that link, and that that's sort of a problem that's not necessarily going to be fixed until we fix the identify the IRI identifier problem. Okay, and don't don't you feel that the the risk is that if you sort of force people to use URIs rather than blank notes, then they're going to come up with their, they will, they, will, they will just coin their own URIs for each and everything they have to deal with. Yeah, well, that, so this is actually a detail that I didn't go into this thing I was talking about resource relationship. The, the, this idea of a Skolem IRI is, uh, is, I think, something not well known, but a cool idea. It's basically a way that anyone can make an assertion that a non-IRI identifier is an IRI. So if you have IRI, if you have non-IRI identifiers that are um, like uh, um, UUIDs, you can uh, UUIDs are by their nature uh, unique, and if you turn them into an IRI using this Skolem IRI process, then you basically have a unique IRI identifier that's usable in linked data without requiring the provider themselves to maintain, to mint and maintain those IRIs. So that's, I guess, what I would say is the trick that I was talking about in, or one of the tricks in representing resource relationship tabular data in a form that is actually uh, something you could put in a triple store. I see okay, thank you very much. Laugh here. <laughs> uh, I think we'll need to move on to the next presentation. Um... And this is going to be Andra. Yes, that's me. Can you hear me? And we can hear you. We can see my, your my... browser window. Oh. Uh... And your speaker notes. Ah, okay, that's not a. Then I just need to select another one. Uh, this one. Share. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Hi. Floor is, uh... floor is yours. Um, thanks for all the 
presenters before because uh, they, they, they allowed me to go a lot faster through my talk since some of the topics already addressed. I want to talk about mods and how you can, uh, and more specifically, how you describe mods in, an, in a knowledge graph like Wikidata. But before I start, I want to send a shout out to my co-authors, uh, being Paul, Manoj, Jose, Sylvain and Kat. With, uh, with whom uh, uh, we have written, I've written uh, a schema on how to model mods on Wikidata. So why mods? Um, mods are, um, are are nice. They're they're a very diverse and uh, very diverse group, and they are less well described than their closest relatives, the butterflies. But are they? Because in one of the descriptions sometimes it says moths are active at night and butterflies are active during the day. Um, it's okay. But here is a moth that I personally like. It's called the Eurasian hummingbird hawk moth, which is actually during the day. So if we witness a moth and we want to learn uh, about the information that can be found on the web. And uh, we can we can go to different websites. We can search the we can search the web. We can go to Wikipedia. We can go to iNaturalist. We can go to GBIF, and the list goes on. This is just a minor selection of of websites that come up in a in a typical web search. But we can also go to APIs, and in APIs we can go to the biodiversity lips, which will which will gives us a list of citations that mentions the. Um, what is known about the, the, the uh, about the moth? We can go to GBIF. We get JSON, and we can go to um, we can go to uh, iNaturalist, which also has JSON. But do note, which was already addressed by Steve, that this is a bit different. There is a hierarchy in the JSON compared to the one at GBIF, and there is um, Platzi. Um, that based on a specific query delivers data data frames or tabular formats on uh, on what is stored in Platzi on that specific mod. So when we try to make sense of that information and we're trying to combine those, we're facing a challenge because each of the different uh, resources come with a steep learning curve. It's not only because of the myriad of methods to access that, it's whether it's a data frame or a specific REST API call, which has their specific queries. There is also a myriad of formats to which extend, to which the data is being presented uh, to the audience. So it's, it's difficult to, to con uh, combine all the different sets. So what I'm um, going to argue here is, I'm, I'm guess I'm one of those, RDF advocate Steve mentioned uh, is RDF. So RDF, it's um, it's the data format for the semantic web, and it follows uh, the the, uh, the triples, the triplets. That is, all all statements are expressed as in the subject predicate object. And here we have such a subject predicate active. This is made up for this call. There is a genus that has a plot CID and the label. So in this example, we have two triples. Two sub this is the subject, those are the predicates, and those are the objects. Now, another data set uh, has the same set of triples. So here we have the mod with a set of predicates, and we can easily combine those data set into a graph, into this graph by concatenating the two triple sets to each other. Um, <clears throat> Now this example was fabricated for the sake of this uh, for this presentation. However, this is an actual RDF data set coming, for example, from Platzi, which has its own representation. But when going to Platzi, and uh, we can see a slight difference in our fabricated example, we used a string to express the Platzi ID, whereas in the data uh, an IRI was used. So uh, to be able to combine the two, we just need to combine the change our data set to, to reuse the uh, IRIs used by, um, by Platzi. And when, do, when we do so, we can then, after doing so, we can concatenate it into a subset, uh, into a set that combines both informations, either on the time that we need it or at a later stage uh, um, to, to get an updated version. We simply need to have this URI from um, Platzi in our data set to be able to link out to other data sets. So to, to recap, so RDF 
is um, built on uh, triples, subject predicate objects, and a, a uniform resource identifier is needed to link the different data sets to each other. And also literals and blank notes, they have already been addressed in previous notes, but uh, I refer to the web uh, for details on this. For, for the rest of my talk, I would like to focus only on the triples and the URIs. So now the question is, this is the famous XKCD standard. So we were focusing with all those uh, different standards. So why should we um, have uh, another standard? And I think Steve already mentioned that a lot. It's not about you know, another standard, it's just, the standard that goes on top of the of the of the data sets. So where do we find the URIs? Uh, again, this is outside the scope of my presentation. Frank already mentioned another ones. These are the two I frequently use, which is the EBI ontology lookup service or the linked open vocabularies. However, there is also Wikidata, which is a part of the Wikimedia infrastructure, and it consists of three components in this infrastructure. We have Wikipedia, we have Wikicommons, which is for images used in Wikipedia, and initially Wikidata was actually like Wikicommons for Wikipedia to, to have structured data. However, it is now going to what uh, Rod already mentioned, the quite a usable uh, data set, uh, knowledge graph that extends the use case of Wikipedia. It is completely free, anybody can contribute, and not also not only not uh, and also quite important, it's stable. It is not dictated by funding cycles of projects. Here is how it works. Um, you can go to any Wikipedia article, and here we have the hummingbird hawk mark. And on the left, there is an item. Uh, there is a link to the Wikidata item, which is stored here. And here we see a, um, a, a, a bit more in detail and. Do note that the subject predicate object notion I was I mentioned earlier can be can be seen here as well. So this is the subject, the macroglossum celeratum, stellatarum, and which in Wikidata terms is called an item. In RDF terms, we would call this the subject. Then we have the predicate in the Wikidata, it's called a property, and we have the object, which is a, a value. Uh, not shown in this example that a Wikidata data model also um, has qualifiers and references, which extends the RDF model, but there is some clever rendering to render those, uh, the references and the qualifiers as RDF is as well. And when you go look under the hood, we do see this RDF representation. This is the RDF representation of the week or actually a subset. So you have the subject predicate object, predicate object. So this can then be com combined with other RDF data sets out there. So now that we have set the stage for Wikidata, how do we get, uh, how do we describe a moth in Wikidata? And then we reach out to Siobhan. Siobhan um, um, react, uh, responded to it. We had a tweet exchange about how do you describe moths? Actually, it was going on with co author Paul and, and Siobhan. And they set out in describing the, the properties and a structure of what a Wikidata of a Wikidata item on a mod should look like. This is this is really telling and helpful, except there are some problems. So for example, we see here the, the instance of a taxon and a synonym, but not all taxons are both a taxon and a synonym. So we need to, uh, that, that's one thing. So one of those items are mandatory and which are optionals. And also, there is also a problem of what are the constraints of uh, the cardinality? Can we have one image? Can we have multiple image? That is where uh, we use a, a formal language, which is the shape expressions. This aligns well with what Frank mentioned as all, with the exception that all is more to describe real life situations and shape expressions is to express uh, the data, not per se the meaning of the data. So here we took the uh, we took the Google Doc and described those in 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 this machine readable format. And as you can see, initially all the selected items of mod failed. We then uh, changed some of the cardinalities. We say uh, we expect more than zero images. The synonymy is optional. The basionym is optional, and uh, we follow the same syntax of of regular expressions. And now we have two out of uh, five that, that needs fixing. This is our uh, guidance species for this talk and it's, it, it fits this schema. 
So the conclusion, RDF allows rapid integration of our Hortigian's data sets. Wikidata renders its content as RDF, which allows combining it with other RDF data sets. Triples allow a myriad of data patterns, and which means that schemas are needed to describe desired patterns. Schemas should initially be described in natural language uh, and then conformed into a formal language like shape expression to check whether the schema fits uh, it, it checked whether the items in Wikidata fit that expectation, either by the user or a data provider. And I end my talk with uh, links about further room. The first, uh, the first two items are the, the schema as described in the course of this presentation. And here are some recommended uh, papers on processes and getting Wikidata on getting data in Wikidata. And finally, we have uh, there is documentation here on to describe shape expressions for those models. That's my talk for now, and I'm happy to take questions. That was great. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> to try and kick out the questioning, um, you you mentioned shape expressions, and you created these to to sort of validate the data. Lots of things in, in Wikidata are community driven. So do you imagine that these would be something the community would assemble and then have to agree upon or? Yes and no, there, there is an extension to Wikidata which is called the Entity Schema Namescape, uh, namescape which uses the shape expression. There is also another format which is constraint violations and that's where they differ. Uh, uh, a shape expression or an entity schema is a document like an item. So the community can, uh, uh, respond to it as they respond to either a Wikipedia page or an uh, or, or a Commons item. So that's one thing, and they are not guiding; they are expressing expectations. So this is how Sylvain and I and Paul and Accorda see how mods should be described on uh, on Wikidata. That is not to say that someone needs to agree. There is some ambiguity that is supported in Wikidata, and using the shape expression, you're able to see. As a customer, this is my expectation of what I want to see from Wikidata. But as a data provider, I can also describe when I provide my data into Wikidata, this is how I present my data. So it's more an, a contract or a document of expectations than it's a policing document that says, this is how it should be. Great. And, and finally, there's a question from Frank. Um, did you apply this shape expression to all the MOTH instances in Wikidata or just the ones that you contributed for your project? For um, no, yes and no. Uh, for MOTH, no, that is still work in progress. So we need to uh, set up uh, to, to do this on all the MOTHs. However, I have applied this on different, we have done it on all the diseases from the disease ontology and we are regularly, so yes, we are regularly uh, applying these on, on large scale items in Wikidata but not yet on mods. Also because I'm not a mod expert. So I think we first need to agree on what is, we, we need a curation session. So because that is something I forgot to mention. When you, when you saw one of those error messages, the error message, which was a red cross in there is not necessarily an, an error. It could also indicate that the schema is still incomplete. So when you have to deal with those, those curation reports, you may need to make the assessment, do I need to fix something in Wikidata or is my schema just incomplete and I need to adapt the schema to the extent that it will fit the data in Wikidata. So it's, it's a bi-directional process. That's great. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much for that. And there are a few more questions popping up in the chat if you want to go in there and, and um, answer some of the questions that are popping up. Will do. So, so moving on, next up we have Ailey who's gonna be talking about ZooNom, gathering the concepts of zoological nomenclature <laughs> And an electronic thesaurus. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And I will now share my screen, and you should be able to see my screen now. Yes, yes, we can. That's great. Thank you. Let's go. So, hello, everyone. My name is Zeli Mario Saliba, and I will be presenting Zoonam today. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, a zoological nomenclature is a sub-discipline uh, sub of taxonomy that is an essential tool for communication between zoologists and scientists in general. Um, zoological nomenclature and it, its product, which is also called a nomenclature, is also useful in the connection of science and natural science in general with the world, for example, in legislation or other biological disciplines. 
the, inter the zoological nomenclature is, um, um, is uh, governed by the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature, being itself managed by the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature. And it has a particular terminology, which is our um, main interest today. So here is an example of a name written following the rules of uh, zoological nomenclature here for the lion. Uh, you're also probably familiar with it. Zoological nomenclature plays a big role in um, biodiversity databases and taxonomy, natural history collection, occurrence or conservation databases. For example, here in the Darwin core, for in the Darwin core, the field um, accepted name usage is a field that uh, requires um, nomenclature uh, here, both botanical and zoological to be filled. The vocabulary of zoological nomenclature is based on the code, but however, sometimes it, the code's vocabulary is ambiguous or incomplete. There have been, for example, a lot of discussion about the term type and uh, other, con uh, other terms like onomatophore that was proposed by Simpson in 1940. The introduction of the term chrysonym by Smith and Smith, chrysonymy by Smith and Smith 1973 and chrysonym by Dubois 1982 or uh, the, the term protonym that was the defined twice uh, with slightly different definitions, uh, once by Dubois in 2000 and another time by, by Pyle in uh, 2004. This is, so Zonum, this is what Zonum looks like and it's designed to make accessible this unofficial vocabulary of the zo of zoological nomenclature. Uh, it's written in SCOS, which is the W3, so it's for Simple Knowledge Organization System. It's the W3C recommendation for Theodorize. And uh, the methodology to build it was collecting terms and, and, um, and creating what is called concept. So it's a, a single idea, if, if you will. It's a single idea, so many terms can be in the same concept. There are than synonyms, sorting this, the, these concepts um, and in collections, uh, semantic collections, and defining them with a definition and adding, if relevant, um, an etymology and, um, and the bi bibliographical citation, and then linking these terms both uh, in a hierarchy and uh, horizontally. Zonum was constructed so uh, using a software called OpenTeso, which is a French um, tetheris making software uh, that can accept and import a lot of RDF format. And, um, and for Zonum, it was first uh, created in CSV, uh, made um, imported into OpenTeso, then tr um, treated here, uh, exported as course, and now it's published on the Lothar uh, platform. Uh, which is a platform that, um, that follows the FAIR principles. Uh, and on the Lothar platform, it's available under the RDF XML format. So um, uh, has 800 concepts and a little bit more definition as a concept can have more than one definition. So it's the same idea, but said differently by different authors. Uh, 920 terms, so some of them are synonyms, that's why there are more than 800 concepts, and they are placed in 20 uh, semantic collection. If you want to use it as a human being, you can obviously use the search bar. All the terms are available on alphabet in alphabetical order in their hierarchy or in groups, which is the equivalent on, lot on the Lotter platform to a collection, and here are the 20 connection that you can uh, use to browse. It's, it's really interesting to use the collection if you don't really know what term you're looking for. By uh, knowing what um, field exactly you're searching, it's, uh, you can find a term if, you, if you're not sure of its, of its existence. This is what a page looks like for each concept. So here is the concept of nomen, which is defined by Dubois in, two, in, two, in 2000 as a scientific name as defined and regulated by the code. You will have then a related concept. Here it's antonym, the synonyms. In the note field, you will have the etymology. In the scope note, if there are more, if there are more definition than the code definition for, for, access, for, uh, available, for accessibility or readability, the code um, definition will be placed in the scope note with the code exact name, exact term for this concept. So here is the, um, 
the word for, um, for nomen, which is scientific name and its definition, the bibliographical citation, uh, bibliographic citation, and uh, its translation in other languages. For an example in computing, let's take the example of uh, nomen dubium. Nomen dubium is a concept that exists in the code and defined as a Latin term meaning a name of a known or doubtful application. However, a nomen dubium actually covers a lot of different situations that can be categorized into three different main categories. If there is an issue with the type, specimen or the type in general, if there is an issue with the identification of the type, or if there is an issue with multiple types, stand types here. So a word, uh, a word was created, a term was introduced for each of these categories, an aptonym, nectonym, and synaptonym. And if we try to visualize a, the, a simplified algorithm of the nomenclature decision making, you can see that nomen dubium, for example, will appear at different places in that tree. And, and, that, and, and that has for, uh, and as a consequence, it's really difficult to know where to place a nomen dubium on this tree. And we have little to no uh, information attached to a name that is tagged, for example, on a database as a nomen dubium. However, by using a more precise vocabulary, we can at least reach a little bit more on the tree and know where this name uh, will appear, which means we have more information attached to it. So for example, a synaptonym has to have more than uh, has to have more than one specimen. Zonum is right now in, in its 1.2 version and the 1.3 version is coming soon with more than 30 new terms and definition, more authors included and minor fixes. If you are aware of a term that doesn't exist in the, in the thesaurus, it's very welcome to be submitted. For this, we ask for, uh, uh, for a term. Uh, the, the, its definition, if relevant, the source and etymology, and we are especially looking for term used in a particular community. In conclusion, uh, I hope that this uh, platform, that this um, thesaurus can ease communicating uh, between colleagues and, uh, and improving exchanges as human beings. It can also nurture discussion on the vocabulary of zoological nomenclature. I strongly encourage also to cherry pick if there's a term or two or uh, some concepts that can be useful in your context for your schemes, for your, um, for your database or what you are working on to go and try to find if there is something that can uh, make, you, um, make you able to, have to access a more precise tagging. And, um, and knowing and being able to have access to a more precise vocabulary is, a, is the first and most important step in the computerization of the rules of, uh, the zo of zoological nomenclature as computers are less, um, on, uh, are less um, able to manage uh, ambiguity. It just happened that it's my PhD thesis subject trying to computerize the rules of, of nomenclature. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eli. That was <clears throat> that was great. Um, lots and lots of interesting details, and there are questions coming through. Um, so I think um, Steve Steve asked the question. So one of the great features of SCOS is that it supports preferred labels in multiple languages. Um, so are you intending to include, I guess, translations of these terms into other languages? Yeah, sure. The, for now, the two languages that are present in Zonum are uh, English and French. And that's because the international code of zoological nomenclature is, uh, there is a version in English and a version in, France, in French. So it was the easier and we happen to be French. So that makes it also easier for us. But uh, it's very welcome if, uh, so if um, to, to make it more available in Spanish or Japanese or other languages, sure. Yeah, and no, I, think, I think both GBIF and, and people like the Bonomia project have been using various sort of crowdfunding or crowdsourcing tools for translation. So I'm sure there are people in Tedwick who'd be keen to offer some advice. Um, 
Another question that sort of came, comes up, um, I guess there are a number of ontologies for describing taxonomic names and relationships between them. Um, do you intend to make any mappings between these different vocabularies and ontologies? It's possible to map. Uh, usually uh, ontologies that exist, exist uh, and are limited to what exists around the code. And this particular uh, thesaurus was made to make accessible things that are not present in the code. So there is, there is a little bit of um, over, um, overlapping with, the, uh, with existing uh, ontologies like Nomen, for example. Um, however, it's not always present and it's not always exactly the same things for, uh, for other type of uh, ontology. So it probably, it could be done. It's a little bit more delicate than what it seems, but it could be done, obviously. Great, and, and Nomen has popped up a couple of times in, in the, the questions. Um, <clears throat> final question is, who's the intended end user of, the, uh, of this, this, this thesaurus? Um, it's been a long day. Uh, for example, a taxonomist, the, the target audience for this vocabulary? Um, depending of what you're doing, it, it might, you might choose the, the, the thesaurus differently. If you're a taxonomist and you are trying to publish or write or uh, trying to communicate uh, with a colleague on a very precise nomenclatural issue, you might have access, you might choose some terms and some concepts that might be interesting. For example, um, using, for example, these uh, terms about nomen dubium, if you want to describe a situation, having access to a definition and something like this to not write each time a huge paragraph. Um, if you are working in databases, you might want to tag some information, for example, distinguishing between what is a uh, 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 what is an uh, objective synonym and a subjective synonym because they don't have the same value taxonomically speaking. So, so if you we need to use different names, exact the different names to not use synonym twice and not have issues of um, of making it uh, redundant or having a risk of um, mixing up things, uh, you can use a more precise vocabulary once again. Great, great. Thanks very much. And I think there are some more questions popping up in the chat if you want to go and pop and have a look and, and answer those. Thanks very much for that. So next up, we have Maria who's been waiting patiently. Maria's going to talk on nano publication, nano publication approach towards big data and biodiversity. Hello. Um, you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, yes. Correct. Yes, we okay. can. Yes, we can see them. Okay. So yes, like you said, I'll be talking about nano publications and their potential to exchange biodiversity data. So to start off, what is a nano publication? Um, is it a type of publication or is it something else? Uh, the definition in the nanopub.org website is uh, the smallest unit of publishable information. However, this definition mostly refers to the type of content in a nano publication, whereas I see a more suitable publication, uh, a more suitable definition be leaked data containers for scientific results and much more, which is again by the nanopop organization, uh, the Twitter account. So the key word here is containers. Uh, and this is because is, each nano publication is actually a graph in itself. Uh, it's a graph which links to three other subgraphs, the assertion, provenance, and publication info. So these three graphs uh, contain different, uh, um, different um, parts of information. The assertion graphs contains a simple fact or uh, the smallest unit of publishable information, whereas the provenance graph contains information about uh, who made that statement. And the publication info contains uh, information about the metadata of the nano publication itself. So who created uh, this, this uh, nano publication? So perhaps most important about nano publications are that they are machine readable in RDF format. So uh, they can be understood mainly by machines because as you can see, as you will see in the next slide, they are not really that human readable. Uh, so that means that each of the subgraphs has its own identifier and uh, you can attribute and cite not only the nano publication, but also 
each of the constituent graphs. And also another important uh, aspect is that nanopublications are immutable. So uh, their um, integrity can be verified using trusty URIs. So the, the content of the nanopublication uh, can, be, can be guaranteed that it hasn't been changed. So this is a simple example of a nanopublication expressing that uh, one person knows another person. And uh, you can see this fact uh, made in the, in the blue box where each two people are uh, distinguished uh, via their ORCID IDs. And also the friend of a friend ontology is used to, the knows property from the friend of a friend ontology is used to define the relationship between these two people. In the, in the red box, you see the provenance of the graph. Uh, so who, um, who made that statement? It's the ORCID ID of the uh, author of that statement. And finally, in the yellow, in the yellow part, you can see um, the metadata of the nanopop itself, when it was created, who created it, and also its uh, um, public key and signature. So, what what infrastructure exists for nano publications? Uh, where are they stored? And the answer is they are stored in a nano publication server network, um, and uh, this is a network of um, servers which stores all of the nano publications. And also, um, how are they created? So um, there is an application called NanoBench. Uh, developed by Tobias Kuhn, which uh, is aimed at creating nanopublications based off templates, and it uh, deals with the digital signing of nanopublications. And how this is done is that anyone can install NanoBench uh, and also uh, authorize themselves with their ORCID ID. So any publication published with NanoBench is automatically associated associated with the ORCID ID of its author. And what is not pictured in this um, diagram is the Nanopop Java library, which is a library that actually um, does the digital signing of the nanopublication. And also it can verify the integrity of nanopublications and the immutability. So what are the opportunities for nanopops uh, to help biodiversity informatics? Why do, we, why do we mention them? And I think that nanopops can be used as, as a way to exchange information between infrastructures. And this is because, um, as we all know, different infrastructures have their own data model. And uh, we have this problem of having to um, map between different data models and APIs. So what if, infrastructures actually exported data in in one common format that could then be um, made into a nano publication and then other infrastructures could uh, subscribe to such nano publications so this is one idea how nanopops can be used to solve this uh, interoperability issue between different infrastructures and also it can help to link between biology domains and within different biology domains. So uh, as long as we know, uh, we agree on a common structure and a common way to express facts. So finally, uh, maybe a third use case for nanopublications is a, a kind of a peer review kind of uh, um, application. And this is because um, because anyone can publish a nano publication, anyone can make a fact about anything, including an another nano publication. So they can be used to comment on previous nano pops which have been published. And uh, it's easy to attribute uh, the actual author of the fact in the nano publication. So you have a full trace of who made different statements and who. Uh, perhaps disagreed or agreed with them. So uh, have nanopops been used in practice and the different, uh, different infrastructures actually uh, produce nanopops and uh, the bubbles here were meant to show uh, 
to circle the nano publication, but this is a, a screenshot from uh, the Global Biotic Interactions website and more specifically the data sets page where you can browse um, the nano publication expression of different data sets. So um, these are actually already published nano publications of existing data sets in Globi. Um, and also this is the biodiversity example, but in other domains, again, of biology, uh, these are some uh, projects or initiatives which use nanopubs and it's mostly for biomedical uh, applications to record gene disease associations as well as uh, as well as uh, biological pathways so i think i might be over time now but um, here are some examples of different nanopub formats that we suggest so the first one is a format for new species and uh, again, you have the blue, red, and yellow um, distinction to help mark up the different parts of the nano publication. But uh, this is on the left is an article from BDJ, uh, which in which a new species has been described, and on the right you can see a nano publication to help express that uh, fact. And we use Darwin core terms, maybe even uh, Noman terms. Uh, as well as other terms from other ontologies to specify who made who made that discovery. So maybe the friend of a friend ontology. Another example is habitat preferences. This is maybe more sweet, suitable for having a small fact because it's a, it's a, si a simple statement which can be expressed as nano publications. And here we've used the Darwin core term Darwin core habitat with seashore cliffs as a literal. However, if we want to go one step further, we could replace that literal with an actual term from ENVO to specify um, the type of environment uh, inhabited by these specimens. And maybe perhaps most importantly, nanopops can be used to make data links, to, to link between different types of information, of different types of uh, biodiversity information, such as uh, gen gene bank accessions, taxonomic information, institution data. And these are all components of the digital specimen actually, because we have information about uh, sequences, uh, material data, literature and uh, taxonomy. So, uh, we think nanopops can be used to record such links. And uh, maybe some of you might ask, uh, why not create separate nanopops for each of those uh, facts and then one nanopop to link them all. However, uh, this would greatly expand the number of nanopops. And we think um, for the purposes of this use case, it's better to have a larger nanopop, but keep the number of nanopops um, to a some limit. So how can how can nanopops be um, make, made more popular? We think that um, by engaging more people in the nanopop community, we can help to uh, create some standards or to engage different biodiversity groups uh, to have a say in how different standards and ontologies can be used to for actually the assertion part of the publication, which is arguably the most important one. And uh, this could help create richer documentation and in increase uptake uh, and production of nanopubs. And finally, uh, it's really important to have examples of working systems. So systems which not only um, produce nanopubs, but also use them for different use cases. And uh, here are some conclusions to say that nanopops and their infrastructure provide a mechanism for exchange of information, uh, which is easily traceable and standardized. However, we need more standards when it comes to the assertion part. And this is where um, community agreement needs to come into play to ensure better interoperability because we wouldn't want to have uh, different identifiers for the same thing or use different ontologies to express the same information. Uh, and then 
one question, which is uh, just an open question, is how can we, how can be, uh, biodiversity infrastructures benefit from nanopops? Whether there's any use cases that you can think of, and maybe even is it worth uh, creating a TEDWIC standard for that to engage the community in discussion? So um, that was my last slide, and uh, since I'm already over limit. Also. Thanks very much, Maria. That was great. And you went actually over time. We were slightly delayed in general. Um, lots of questions popping up in the chat. Um, I don't think we're going to have time for all of them, but maybe we can bring some of them up in the discussion afterwards. But so, so one quick question I have is um, so is, is a nanopub a unit of work? So I imagine that if I have an orchid idea saying I made this nanopub and I make a thousand nanopubs. Do I have a thousand things popping up in my ORCID profile? Uh, actually, uh, currently on your ORCID profile, you can't you can't really see the nanopops you published because I've published some and they are there. So uh, you can see that you can use your ORCID profile to alter to authorize nanobench, but you can't really see them all. Uh, that would be actually a great thing because it would incentivize people to publish more. Uh, so it makes sense that something like this exists, but it hasn't been set up. So I imagine you could do something like if, if they each had a DOI, they could maybe automatically be picked up. There's an intriguing question from Frank, and I think, Frank, you should probably ask this yourself. Yeah. Um... Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Maria. In fact, the, the, when you presented the use case uh, with uh, the annotations of documents, distributed annotation system, it made me think of a uh, work of Savin, uh, what is his name? Savin Kapadisli uh, from the semantic web community. And uh, with uh, Ruben Verborg Verg Verg and uh, Tim Berners-Lee, they have made a proposition uh, that's called decentralized authoring annotations and notifications for read write web with Docially. Are you aware of that? Uh, it rings a bell, but I'm not currently. I can't because, really comment. Okay, because it, I think there are quite some common commonalities. Their their idea is to use a bunch of technologies together. Uh, so the first one will be linked data notifications that allows to. Uh, publish a notification about some, some event. Uh, use the web annotations ontology to comment on some resource on the web. A web ID to identify people, but not only to do that, but also to sign uh, the, the notifications. And then all of those, this is distributed, is, is stored in a distributed manner using the solid, um, uh, solid platform, the solid infrastructure based on the linked data platform. So anybody could have their own linked data platform repository where they would uh, store some annotations about a resource. And then whenever an annotation is, is uh, published, uh, it's gonna, the, the, the originating resource will be notified with the linked data notification and so on. So that's really a distributed storage of, not, of annotations uh, that, that are signed by, by the people, by, by their web IDs, stuff like that. So, uh, I'm not sure how close this is to nanopubs or if I mix things that shouldn't be mixed. I'm not sure. I think that sounds really close to nanopubs and uh, they are de decentralized. So, um, and also you can use things like the garlic API to um, retrieve nanopubs, which follow a certain pattern. So yes. Uh, but this the slide I had with um, the sub the subscribe um, subscribe uh, bubbles was just an idea. It's not implemented yet. Okay. 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 Well. Anyway, if if later on you you I'll check it out. You read yeah. this uh, this papers. I can I can send you the the references. I, I would really be interested in your um, your whole feedback about this. Yeah, I would love to. Okay. 
Great. Well, I guess that concludes the, the formal part of the, the session. I'd just like to thank um, all the speakers and everybody who um, took part. Um, so I think we actually still have about 10 minutes allotted in the timetable. So if anybody has any other further kind of questions or wants to make any observations, there's also a chance that the speakers um, want to sort of um, make some additional points or sort of maybe they've spotted any common themes. Um, and uh, so we can hang around for the next 10 minutes and chat a bit. Um, uh, for those in the audience who had more than enough knowledge grass, thank you much for your time and attention. But we're here for the next 10 minutes and eager to discuss further. And uh, thank you to all my speakers for your very stimulating presentations. So there, there are a bunch of questions still sitting in the chat we haven't really tackled. Um, Steve, do you want to ask your question to Maria about denotations? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering whether the web annotations um, model is a part of the and is that used to do the annotations? And Frank also mentioned that in what he was talking about. I didn't really get the question. Maybe I should read the. Maybe I should read it in the Q and A because. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether the, there's a W3C web annotations um, model that defines terms for describing annotations. And I'm just wondering whether that's a part of, like in the serialization of the NanoPub RDF data, does it use that model? I don't know. <laughs> I, if, I, if I can say a word about this, I, can, I think, in some use cases, it totally makes sense to use the web annotations ontology as the statements of the nano publication, but not all the time. So in the case of uh, yeah, commenting on a resource, your statement, the, the, the statement part of your nano publication would typically be using uh, uh, the web annotations ontology, but that's just one, one of many use cases probably. Yeah, I've recently seen different examples of even in the provenance part of the nanopop and the publication info, which are meant to be more standardized. I have seen different uh, usages of different ontologies to express uh, the source of information or the date or so on. We've got a, a question just coming from David Shorthouse, um, which is addressed to everybody. What, recommend, what recommendations do you have for those busy developing ex digital extended specimens? Um, assuming we all know what they are, I'm entirely sure I know what they are, but um, so do we have any recommendations for those trying to bring specimens online and link them to other data sets? Maybe uh, a quote and I'm now going to be a proponent of RDF, but a quote mm -hmm. from Frank van Harmelen uh, at um, Swat for Less in Edinburgh, I think a few years back, and says that um, RDF does not solve problems. It just puts everything on the table. And I really like that quote because sometimes you think like hey, the, the message is just go for RDF and your life will be easy. And I think that's not true. So, and still with that in mind, I think it's, if I would really invite everybody to consider, consider RDF because it allows you to dive into, into the semantic problems we have. And as I said, it doesn't solve anything. It just puts it on the table. Yeah, maybe if I can add something, I, I'm not sure uh, what, uh, what David expects uh, as, as a response, uh, but in the, the presentation I've made in the talk, uh, I was mentioning the question of having the possibility to model the same thing uh, in lots of different ways, depending on the perspective. And to my mind, this is one of the issues uh, that is really hard. Uh, first, when you design the way you're gonna publish your data as a knowledge graph, so using OWL, using RDFS, so on, or SCOS, or, um, and that this is really very much driven by the use cases. So publishing 
a knowledge graph about some data without knowing what people are going to do about, with it is not easy. It, at some point, you have to do it because the point is to publish data and see whether some people have a good, nice, clever ideas to reuse your data and do some, some fancy stuff with that. But it's not easy because uh, you always have a certain bias in, in the sense that you see your data from a certain perspective. Um, that's, that's something that has to be discussed maybe with potential users or I don't know. This is, from my perspective, one of the main issues when, when, when designing knowledge graphs. But there are probably others. And I, yeah, again, I don't know if, if that answers your question, David. Steve, I'm sure you've got something to say on this. Well, I was actually going to just turn the question around. And one of the things I've never really understood about digital extended specimens is how are they different from making machine readable metadata available about physical specimens? I mean, it seems to me like that's been what Tadwig has been wanting to do for the last 15 years. And other than rebranding it and giving it a different name, I, I don't really understand how a digital extended specimen is anything different than what we've been trying to do other than, you know, like there's a grant for it. <laughs> so we I mean, I would it. also advocate making it into linked data because, you know, that's my bias. And that's what everybody says they want to do to link data. And RDF seems to be the standard way to do that. I'm eagerly awaiting somebody to come in um, and challenge whether digital extended specimens are simply um, window dressing in order to get funding. That would be wrong. Um, yeah, but, but I guess it is a general notion of, of having this identifiable specimens with unique identifiers that are linked to other sources of information. Um, but if I, uh, sorry, suppose. Yeah, we, we have a few, a few people raising their hand. There is uh, Uter, Adlink, and uh, Deborah, and maybe Urter. I, I don't know who was first, honestly. Walter can go first. I don't know if his mic is open. Maybe Avery can open Walter adding. His okay, mic. That's, that's fine for me. Can go you hear me? Yeah, yes. sure. Um, yeah, uh, a, a digital specimen is an, um, uh, an, an, uh, an object on the internet that uh, has its own uh, independent life of, uh, of the physical specimen and, and the physical specimen record. Um, so that is what is fundamentally different. And what we want to, to um, use it for is to, to enable um, to records information uh, for, from a community creation perspective as soon as there is uh, uh, information that the, the physical object exists actually. So it goes beyond um, traditional uh, standard Darwin core approach that we um, want to, uh, to provide um, scientifically meaningful data about a uh, specimen. We want to um, to already uh, share uh, an image of a specimen as, as soon as we have it, so that uh, all the services can come in and uh, extract uh, more information uh, from that from the image, which then becomes relevant for science. It also goes beyond um, uh, Darren Core is, is that we want to move away from the traditional uh, publishing model to, to a model where you can actually go to the data and, and get access to the data. Um, so instead of um, only sharing data as open data, we want to share all the data that we, that we have as fair data, uh, also data that cannot be open for, for several reasons. But as long as you have the, the, the correct rights to access the data, you can go to the data and, and access it. I hope that, that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, I think for me, I would just add this putting it on the table um, is like this first huge step, uh, getting it out there in that sense. And, and then this notion of what it allows. So if we can get identifiers, uh, richer identifiers, so Rod, you, would, you know, and, and Steve apply, you know, what's different than what we're doing now. Um, but if we can get these identifiers for everything, essentially, um, then this specimen has this. Uh, it can go on a lot more dates 
on a lot more places on the internet, right? It can interact and be interacted with and potentially linked to um, in ways that we still can't do yet. Yeah. And the, that's the social, sorry, I was gonna say, sorry, and that's social as well as technical, right? Both sides of them. The, the digital specimen can, can use the uh, linked open data technology. Uh, so in, in that uh, digital objects are expressed as the HMLB, uh, uh, shape expressions, uh, also to validate data. Uh, but we want to go beyond machine readability. Uh, we want to, to go uh, to machine actionability, uh, actually. Um, so we want to uh, describe the types of the, the objects much more specific so that machines can, can really act upon them. That's, of course, a very challenging uh, approach, but uh, that's yeah. most of the ideas behind it. I would say, Walter, both, though. I mean, if we're doing this, then it also is allowing humans to interact with this data in ways that this, this um, community curation that we've been talking about, that we empower humans to be uh, more um, able to have an effect on the data than they can right now. Okay, I, I guess I'm conscious that we're sort of now squatting um, on the Zoom link. So, um, could I say thanks everybody for the really great, interesting presentations. Um, I really enjoyed that. We've still got questions sitting in the Q&A. Um, I'm sure that the audience would appreciate whatever we can contribute to that. Um, so thanks again, everybody was on time and it was really richly detailed and good slides. So um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the, rest of the conference.